Okay, well, I um, hope you can hear me over the din. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been uh, spending my time thinking about, which is how we sort of solve the, uh, what I refer to as the, the main challenge we have today, which is how to build better instruments. If you think of, of, of you know, science, back in the early part of the century, if people wanted to do great science, they built a big telescope, and the people who had the best telescopes did the best astronomy. Later on, people built big particle accelerators, and the people who had the biggest particle accelerators did the best science. Today, the people with the biggest computers do the best science. An amazing amount of scientific discovery from climate science to combustion science to understanding the, the you know, formation of how galaxies are formed and interact with one another is really done through, through computational experiment. And if you have the best computers, you do the best science. It's also the case that if you want to basically make the best business decisions, you need the biggest computer. And it's very much the same set of techniques that people apply to business analytics that they apply to scientific computing. So whether you want to do the best science or make the best business decisions, what you need today is, is the best possible computer. Um, the, the race to exascale, there's nothing particularly special about an exaflop, but it's kind of a placeholder for us on a target for getting to the next sort of quantitative level of computing performance. Um, and the goal is to have an exaflops of performance on real applications, not just an exaflops on some arbitrary benchmark like um, HPC Linpack or, or on anything else, but an exaflop on real applications within a power envelope of 20 megawatts. And that power envelope is really a proxy for total cost of ownership. This has to be an affordable system um, for an exaflop. There's, you know, there, there's no real requirement. It doesn't have to run off of batteries or anything like that or, or live within a certain thermal envelope. But 20 megawatts is basically costs $20 million a year to pay the power bill on, and it's a great proxy for total cost of ownership. If you b burn much more power than that, it becomes unaffordable. Um, <clears throat> so there are really two key challenges on the way to exascale, and I'll talk about both of these in a minute. Let's talk about where we are today. So the, uh, the most powerful open science machine in the United States today is Titan um, at 2.5 gigaflops per watt. That's really kind of the key metric here. It's you know, almost 30 gigaflops peak, sustains 18 on HPC Linpack, sustains a good fraction of that on many real applications. Now it turns out the reason why it's only 2.5 gigaflops per watt is because of the darn CPUs. The, the K20s in, in Titan contribute more than 90% of the floating point operations, but consume less than half the power. Um, so for an, another good example of a machine um, that uses K20 is the Tsubami KFC at Tokyo Tech. That's number one on the green 500 list. Um, it um, is 4.5 gigaflops per watt with the same GPUs, and they do a number of things to get there. Um, one involves this fancy liquid um, immersion cooling where they put the GPUs into this oil bath. I assume that's why they call it KFC, because it's kind of like what Kentucky Fried Chicken does with their chickens, putting them in the uh, deep fryer. Um, but, but actually, the, reason why, the main reason why it gets such good performance is that they've changed the GPU to CPU ratio and more of the watts are going to the GPU and fewer to the CPU. In fact, if you, had, if you didn't need the pesky CPU at all, K20 itself is about seven gigaflops per watt. So one way to think about the path to exascale is it's this green line here, where you are here at 20 petaflops, um, 10 megawatts, and 10 to the seventh threads needed to fill this machine. And we want to get out to 2023. And in 2023, we need to have a 50 times improvement um, to get from 20 petaflops to an exaflop um, at only 2x the power. So our power efficiency has to go up by 25x. Now in the good old days when, when not only Moore's Law but Denard scaling was in effect, we would get a lot of that from process technology. Today our estimate is we're going to get about a factor of four from process technology and the remainder of the 25 is going to have to come from better architecture and better circuits. Um, and also we're going to go the number of threads we have from 10 to the seventh to 10 to the 10th. That's a qualitative difference in the amount of parallelism you need to, to program these machines. So people who think that they can take their dusty old, you know, something plus MPI decks and run them on the new machines, well, they'll run, but they'll run with 10 to the seventh threads. It's going to require a different um, approach to programming, a different way of factoring these codes to get the kind of parallelism you need to fill a machine with that many threads. Now, we are going to give ourselves a midterm report card on this path to exascale um, in 2017 with the coral machines that were announced at the uh, press conference in Washington by Secretary Muniz last Friday. Um, and these machines are, and all we're saying about them publicly right now is a range of 150 to 300 petaflops. So five to 10 times the performance of, um, of Titan um, at only 10% more power. 
So basically what we're saying is it's going to be seven to 14 times more efficiency, and that's only 40% of the, of the way across this path. So if, if we can basically hold the level of improvement we've gotten getting to Coral, we'll be at that 25x um, with no problem because we've already closed you know, more than half of that gap on a logarithmic scale. Um, and you know, we're not saying how many threads it is. If you can imagine it's somewhere intermediate between the two of these, so it'll be a great target machine to start working on, on the programmability issues of very large numbers of threads. So let me talk about the two problems this represents um, one at a time. So the first problem, recall, is getting from order of two gigaflops per watt to 50 gigaflops per watt, this 25x performance improvement when only about 4x is coming from the semiconductor process. And the other is basically making this thing programmable with a thousand times um, more threads. So let's talk about the energy efficiency first. So the first thing we have to, to, to discuss is what the problem isn't. It isn't about arithmetic. I could build an exaflop machine today if the only objective was to make it do um, 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second because that, that is actually not to scale a double precision floating point multiply add unit. If it was to scale, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, it it's actually about um, you know, uh, 0.01 square millimeters, right? So it's, I can put 100 in a square millimeter. Um, and I have a chip that's 10 millimeters on a side, so I have 100 square millimeters. I could put 10 to the fourth of them on this chip. Um, and they consume um, 10 picojoules per op, so two gigaflops. Um, they're, they're consuming um, sort of uh, you know, 200 watts to fill the whole chip. So basically, um, I would have an exaflop machine at half the required power today in a 16 nanometer technology if all I had to do was the floating point operations. So if you take nothing else away from this talk, take away from this talk that the floating point operations are free. They're not the problem. So what is the problem? Well, it's two things. It's overhead and it's locality. So what do I mean by overhead? So if you think about, hello, I pressed the wrong button. Um, if you think about um, you know, a efficiency, what you need to do is you need to look at a processor and ask, where does the energy in that processor go? And here are pie charts for two processors. This is a uh, efficient in-order core, and even for the most efficient in-order cores, the kind of things that you see in, in embedded machines, only about 6% of the energy goes into ALU operations, and actually only about 2% is payload ALU operations. The other are things like incrementing the program counter, incrementing index registers to, to walk arrays. The things you actually count as operations in the program is only a couple percent. In the out of order high performance machine, 4% is in AOU operations and a fraction of a percent is payload. In fact, the right way to think about this pie chart is a, uh, a top of the line Intel um, Haswell processor consumes about one nanojoule per instruction. And we know that doing a floating point operation takes about 20 picojoules in, in actually a process that's not quite as good as the 14 nanometer that that's in. And so you can think of the overhead as being this 980 picojoules and the payload arithmetic being 20 picojoules. The vast majority of the energy is going to overhead. Why is that? Well, this is a, a, the pipeline of a typical out of order machine. This is actually an old DEC Alpha, but the modern um, you know, Intel out of order processors, the latency optimized cores are quite similar. And, and w the reason why they have such high overhead is that they spend an enormous amount of energy to basically solve the problem of keeping a pipeline busy when you're not sure on a single thread, when you're not sure whether doing a memory operation is going to take three cycles and hit the L1 cache or 100 cycles and have to go all the way out to DRAM. And the way they do that is that they basically schedule the instructions at runtime. Um, they also, to find enough instructions to schedule to hide the latency of, of cache misses, they have to predict through several branches speculatively. When they get that wrong, they have to squash those speculative operations and roll the pipeline back. So most of the blocks in this chart aren't doing payload operations. They're doing things like predicting whether this instruction is a branch, whether that branch is taken, and if it's taken, where is it going? And you don't do that prediction just for branch instructions, because you have to do that prediction before you even look at the instruction. You access two very large tables before you even you know, look at the instruction for every instruction to decide what instruction to fetch next, because you can't wait to see if it's a branch and, and do that branch. This actually consumes as much operation, as much energy, before you've even fetched the instruction as doing the floating point operation. Then you have to fetch the instruction, you run it through a bunch of queues, you have schedulers, you rename all the registers. All this stuff consumes enormous energy. That's where that whole 980 picojoules goes. Somewhere over here are the actual arithmetic units that do the real work. It's a drop in the bucket, both area-wise and energy-wise, on these chips. 
The analogy I make is imagine you had a shoe factory where the entire building was full of people deciding what color to make the shoes and what sizes are popular this year and whether to make loafers or lace-ups, um, you know, um, what style to make the laces, um, what order in which to schedule the making of these shoes. And down in the basement are three guys making shoes. Um, you know, you, you have thousands of executives doing the planning and three guys making the shoes over here. That's what a typical CPU is like. In contrast, um, our GPUs have data paths look a lot more like this, where basically almost everything here is doing useful work. We have a very simple execution pipeline where we decide what thread to execute, drop an instruction from that thread down the pipeline, and with no further decision making, um, that, that instruction basically causes registers to be fetched, operations to happen, and we put the result back. Well, how is it we get around this problem of dealing with long latency memory operations inexpensively when they spend 980 picojoules um, per instruction to do it? And the reason is that we assume you have lots of threads. This is what we refer to as a throughput optimized core. And so whenever you have a long latency memory operation, we simply run another thread. And that's a very simple and inexpensive way to hide latency um, when you have a lot of parallelism. So when you have a lot of parallelism, which is typically the case with, with most problems that are demanding, they're demanding because you're iterating over a large data set that gives you lots of parallel, parallel um, elements to execute at, at the same time. This is way more efficient to do it. Um, on our latest generation of, of GPUs, we are basically at parity. We have half of our energy going into payload arithmetic, half of our energy going into overhead. You still want heterogeneous computing systems where you have a few of the expensive latency optimized cores, and you want that because occasionally you get to a point where you need to run one thread very quickly and everybody else is waiting for the answer to that thread. Then you're willing to burn you know, a nanojoule per instruction running that thread. The rest of the time, you'd rather be burning 40 picojoules per instruction um, doing lots of work in parallel. Um, so once you've beaten the, the monster of overhead down and you have a very efficient processor core, well, you find out that the bulk of your energy is not being spent in that processor core. It's being spent moving data to feed that processor core because floating point units are much like pets or children in that they're relatively inexpensive to acquire but really expensive to take care of. They need constant feeding. You have to dispose of what they produce. Um, and, and arithmetic units are the same way. So to do one 20 picojoule floating point operation, um, I basically need to bring it 256 bits. Th I need to bring it um, three input operands, um, 64 bits, and, and, and actually an input instruction. And, and then take the output operand and put it, put it somewhere. So even if I get those only a millimeter away, very local access to those operands, it's more energy to move the operands, 26 picojoules, than it is to do the operation. And of course, the operands didn't materialize on the other end of that wire. I had to read them out of some memory array or register file. Even a relatively small register file, it's more than twice as much energy just to read the operands out of the register file as it is to do the arithmetic operation. So moving data around is, is really expensive. Um, moving it across a chip is an order of magnitude, or I should say from random location on the chip is an order of magnitude more expensive. Moving it from the other corner of the chip um, is uh, you know, a factor of 50 uh, more expensive. Um, going off chip is, is, even, is even more. So one way to think about the, the energy challenge once you've taken care of overhead is with, is with this chart. And I re sort of re refer to this as a locality challenge. If you take a look at a typical application, you can characterize its working set sizes by what the byte per flop bandwidth demand is to different sizes of memories. So to the nearest level of memory, which you might think of as, as a L0 or a register file, um, I need to get a word, at least a word per cycle um, out of that. Going out to an L1 cache, I can be down to a quarter of a word each cycle because I have some reuse out of registers. Um, at, at a uh, megabyte cache, which you might think of as, as an LLC, I get um, down to about, uh, about an eighth of a word per cycle, and I get even less out at 32 meg and one gig, which might be the stacked memory on the GPU package. Now I can take that bandwidth demand curve, which is a green line here, and multiply it by the blue line here, which is what that bandwidth costs. Getting data from nearby the processor is relatively cheap. It's, this is that um, sort of you know, 50 picojoule to fetch from the memory plus 26 to move in a millimeter. This is a, you know, a small amount more. Here I have the global on-chip communication of about 250 um, picojoules and so on. Up to getting it from, from off-chip is extremely expensive. Um, this is on the, uh, the blue scale here um, is uh, picojoules per byte. This is 200 picojoules per byte to fetch a word from DRAM. So um, 
whenever you have a problem like this, you want to attack both parts of it. What we want to do is we want to do, um, make it less expensive to move data around, better um, technology to reduce the cost in picojoules per byte, and then better programming systems to reduce the amount of data we're moving. So let's talk about the technology first. Now the trends are working against us here. Um, a while back at NVIDIA, I sort of uh, started to talk about the shopping cart approach to, to managing the energy of GPUs. And this is because I was talking to a bunch of our designers and I asked, well, how much does it cost to do this and this? And they said, well, I don't know. I said, well, we're doing that in our GPU. Don't we know what, how much energy it is? How do we find out? I said, well, we, we wait until we're done and we plug it in. And that's the way we used to design GPUs. We don't do that anymore. We now basically, and, and my analogy was, you wouldn't go through the grocery store and throw things into your shopping cart without knowing the price of them because then you get to the checkout counter and you either need to negotiate a loan or you're running back to the shelves with the things that are, that are too expensive. And so you have to design GPUs the same way. You need to know energy-wise what everything costs in picojoules. And then when you design things, you, there's no surprises. You know what the end result is going to be. Now what you'll notice is that the cost of many things for example, the cost of a, of a DFMA going from 40 nanometer, that's actually old technology, that's Fermi generation technology, to 10 nanometers, which is the Volta technology, is, is about a six to seven to one jump. Um, similarly, reading a bit of, of um, from SRAM is, is about a seven to one jump. But moving a bit across a wire is less than two to one. So the trends are actually against us. The arithmetic is getting less expensive not as fast as in the good old days of, of Denard scaling, but it's getting less expensive roughly linearly with, with technology. Moving bits is hardly getting less expensive at all, so it's working against us. How do we solve this problem? Um, so we want to do two things, minimize the data movement and move data more efficiently. Let me talk about the more efficient data movement first. Um, this chart shows um, the energy to move a bit on chip, which we express in, in um, femtojoules per bit per millimeter. So to move one bit, one millimeter on chip usually costs about 200 femtojoules. And that's using um, the, the technique that everybody uses is almost the worst possible way of doing it. You signal a one with the power supply and a zero with ground. And so you're actually you're using an enormous amount of energy. Um, you know, your signal to noise ratio is in the tens of thousands, way more than you need. Um, this chart is from a Stanford PhD thesis which um, uh, built a working chip that demonstrated this, about 20, picojoule, 20 femtojoule per bit millimeter by basically signaling much more intelligently using lower swings and, and more clever detection of the bits. So you can get an order of magnitude in the cost of moving those bits on chip. Similarly, you can get an order of magnitude moving bits off chip. Currently going out to SDDR DRAM or GDDR DRAM costs between 20 and 30 picojoules per bit. Um, this was a chip we demonstrated, it was the best paper at ISSCC um, um, last year, not this year, um, and uh, it basically is a half a picojoule per bit. I didn't put that number up here anyway, but it's so it's basically more than an order of magnitude improvement in typical off-chip signaling technology. So between the uh, the improvements in off-chip signaling and on-chip signaling, we can take this chart and notice I'm about to change the axis on the right and turn it into this chart: 77 picojoules or 77 picojoules per flop, down to 18 picojoules per flop, which by the way gets us under. Um, the critical 20 needed for an, an exaflop at, uh, at, at 20 megawatts. But we're not done yet, right? Because we haven't attached, attacked the um, byte per flop line. And what we do to attack that is, is through our co-design process with the national labs, we've looked at a number of, of the mini apps and other applications. And what we've observed is, yeah, there's some of them that are bad, that basically, if you look at the fraction of memory footprint and the fraction of memory bandwidth that consumes, it's almost a straight line. Many of them have most of the memory bandwidth consumed by a relatively small fraction of, of the actual um, memory address space. And in fact, if you then plot that with data structure access, a relatively small number of the data structures account for 80 to 90% of the memory bandwidth. So by placing those cleverly and then blocking the remaining accesses, we can dramatically reduce the bandwidth demand, the bytes per flop demand, so that now we can um, take that, um, well, this is where we were before, the 18 picojoules that for better circuits, and make it nine picojoule per flop um, with the combination of better circuits and good program analysis and, and auto-tuning tools. Um, so with the, about five minutes remaining, let me address the, the programming issue. So um, with the Exascale program, we actually have a historic opportunity to get people to think about programming in a different way. Um, the way we currently program very large-scale machines is in many ways a, an outcome of a technique that was really pushed by the Department of Energy during the last time we had a, a big push in computing, which was during the ASCII program in the mid-90s, when MPI was, you know, there was sort of a, um, you know, 
you know, sort of Tower of Babel of different ways of programming cluster machines, and DOE really pushed MPI as a unifying um, uh, pr approach to get everybody using the same programming notation, and pulled a lot of things together, made it a much more productive environment. I think we have a historic opportunity to do that again and to raise the level of programming. And the way to think about this is that parallel programming is really quite easy. So for, for example, if I want to write a molecular dynamics code, I could simply write something like this, where I say, for every molecule, for every neighbor of that molecule, for every force I want to apply to that um, molecule based on that neighbor, compute the force and sum them up. And, and this should be executable. And then there's another little fragment I didn't write down here. After, you, after you're done with this computation, you then have the push, where you take that force and advance every molecule one time step. Um, most people write code which is much more complicated than this because they're, they're, um, they're sort of making it difficult. It's easy to make parallel programming difficult. To make it easy, you basically want to write it in a way that's independent of the machine. You want to express all of your parallelism. Most people write their program specialized to one machine where they decide in their code how much parallelism to actually exploit as parallelism in space and how much to unroll in time. Um, and, and exploit serially, because they typically have more parallelism than the machine can support. You don't want to make that decision in your code, because then it makes your code non-portable. You want to make, make that decision when, when you do the, the mapping of that code to a machine. And then a lot of people spend a lot of time on communication and synchronization. That's all implicit here in the, in the computation that's going on. Now, there are some people who like to make programming difficult, because they like to impress their friends with how smart they are. And they do things like creating threads and, and ex explicitly acquiring locks and and uh, sending messages, but humans weren't meant to write code like this. And in fact, a lot of the, the issue here is, is basically solving a problem that I learned when I was a youth soccer coach. And the most common uh, thing I would say to my team is don't steal the ball from her, she's on your team. It's about not people not playing their position. And the position of the programmer here is to write code like this, where they basically expose all of the parallelism, expose abstract notions of locality, and say what the algorithm is. The programming tools do the mapping, and the architecture gets out of the way. It basically provides you know, access to the storage hierarchy and access to the fast communication and synchronization resources and doesn't impose policy on the programming system. So our vision for, for this is a target independent programming system where you write your code in, in sort of a um, mapping of operations over sets and doing reductions um, style like this, although the notation we're favoring is more like C++. Um, in fact, it is, a, it is what will hopefully be a future version of the C++ standard. Um, and that's target independent. You haven't made any decisions about how to block to a particular memory structure or how much of the parallelism to exploit in time versus space. Um, those are mapping decisions that are made by a set of mapping tools. And our goal is to make these mapping tools good enough that for most programs, um, you basically take your target independent source, you produce a target independent executable, and that gets you close enough to the best performance you could get that you're done. So say you're, you're at 70% you know, of the best performance you could get. Some people won't be happy with that. They'll then profile that and visualize the code and say, oh, that mapping could be done a little bit better. We don't want them to go back and modify this code. We want them to set up a number of mapping directives to tell the tools, do it this way instead. And then they can get to 100% of the best you can do and still have code which could be ported to different manufacturers' processors, to different generations of a given manufacturer's processor. So what do we expect this exascale machine to look like? Um, here's our system sketch of a heterogeneous compute node. And I should point out that this is not necessarily one chip. You may have a situation where the, um, the latency optimized cores, the CPUs, and the throughput optimized cores, the GPUs, are on different die or even from different manufacturers. And our NVLink technology facilitates um, basically essentially extending this knock between many chips over an external link. Um, we have on package very high bandwidth memory with stacked DRAM off-package bulk memory um, and non-volatile memory for, for fast checkpointing, um, and, and up to an exaflop just by cascading these nodes. Given the time limit, I will not go into much detail on that. One thing we're, we're very interested in doing is making sure that there's a very good open ecosystem to have many different people participate in building the best technology for these machines. And a big part of that is having a network um, that, that gives you what you want for HPC. Very low latency, scalable bandwidth, so you can provision how much you want um, for different um, target machines. Um, it, being able to do PGAS gets and puts of 32 bytes at 50% payload efficiency in the network. So you don't have to marshal things up to 4K byte messages to get good efficiency. Um, 
and then good, good support for collectives and atomics and even MPI offload, so your CPU isn't burning any cycles doing tag matching and things like that. Um, and one philosophy we've recently been pushing is the notion of this being one network. So we already have a network on our chip, this NOC, um, so when these throughput optimized cores do loads and stores, they're actually sending packets over this NOC to this memory system. And our view is that all the on-chip um, all, all the on -chip NIC does is it's a protocol translator that translates those packets to the packets that run over the system interconnect. Similarly, if we connect up latency optimized cores via NVLink, um, that is the same one network and it's just a protocol translator between NVLink, the on-chip network, and whatever the system area network is. And we'd like to define the system area network with a set of standards so different vendors can be providing the locks, the, the talks, and the network, and you can basically build a best of breed machine rather than being locked into one manufacturer for all of these pieces. So one thing that's been very key to us in, in doing this is the, um, I'm just going to do all the animations at once, is, is the co-design process we've been going on with the Department of Energy where, where we've taken a number of their mini apps and have looked at um, what are the bottlenecks in getting good performance out of them. And it's been very illuminating to us. And it's one of these processes where just changing the applications wouldn't get you to where you need to be and just changing the architecture wouldn't get you to where you need to be. But by co-evolving both, we've been able to get good performance. And so what this chart shows is the 25X we need, that's the um, red line here, um, to get to um, exaflop performance on these applications. Um, and the dotted line is basically if we took our existing architecture and just took advantage of better process technology by 2023, you notice we don't get there. We're at four, not 25. Um, and what these bars show is by co-evolving our architecture and doing some recoding of the applications to basically expose more locality to our tools, we've been able for many of these mini apps to get over um, this bar. Um, and th this has been doing things like finding out where the bottlenecks are. For example, that many of them have a bottleneck with memory footprint per thread. We needed to provide more L1 storage per thread, so we did that. We needed to provide um, you know, uh, better um, synchronization mechanisms. We did that. We needed to provide um, you know, better single thread um, performance so you could fill the machine with fewer threads. We did that. I should say we did that in, in our simulated exascale machine. This is not a product that we have announced or, or, or is on our, our officially disclosed roadmap yet. You'll see that there's also still some that are being hard. These tend to be the more irregular ones and the ones that are more limited by memory bandwidth and less by, less by floating point, and also some of which are, are limited by integers. You see um, the, the yellow one here, Mini FE, spends a lot of time um, dealing with the index structure and, and less time actually doing the floating point operations. And so we're working on understanding how to co-evolve the application and the architecture to get to where we need to on those as well. We're not done, but our, our early success is, is actually very encouraging. Um, so let me wrap up here really quickly before I uh, run over time. I'm getting the, the nasty looks from Allison over there. Um, so what, what are the key problems in getting from where we are today to a sustained exaflop on real applications? Um, there, there, really, there, there are many, but there are two that stand out to me. The first is energy efficiency, and, and we really sort of have a three-prong approach to this, one of which hand is, deals with the, with the overhead pr part of, of energy efficiency, we go from you know, the way CPUs are with a tiny sliver of the power actually doing useful work to GPUs, which today have about half the power doing useful work. Um, that gets rid of the, over, the overhead problem. We then realize that most of our energy is spent moving data around. And we, we solve that with two things. One is efficient signaling circuits. And I gave you a couple examples of how we're able to improve by an order of magnitude or more the energy per bit millimeter needed to move um, bits around our chip. Um, and at the same time, through better programming tools, we basically enhance our locality and get about another factor of two um, by reducing the need for data movement, um, by you know, optimizing the placement of data initially, and better methods for moving the data dynamically between the levels of the memory hierarchy. Um, then we have to deal with how to program 10 to the 10th threads. Um, and our view is that this is going to require recoding your programs. Let's take advantage of that need to recode and recode in a way that basically you'll, you won't have to recode again for a very long time in a target independent manner where you express all of the parallelism and abstract notion of the locality and let the, the tools um, do this mapping to the target dependent executable and then tune that additionally as needed via this loop. That will then give you very portable codes that can be scaled up and down different sizes of the machines and across different manufacturers' machines. Um, and finally, I gave you a sketch of what our uh, our vision of an exascale node that really encompasses both, both of these things, the hardware support for this programming style and the very efficient architecture that will get us to um, an exascale. 
and how we want to build an ecosystem where we can then collaborate with the people who build the latency optimized cores and, and systems with networks um, by having an open HPC ecosystem that plugs all of this stuff together with one network. So with that, I, I hope I have a couple seconds left for questions.